The very first video game ever made is the Nimatron, a custom built computer created in the year 1940 that plays a version of the classical matchstick game Nim. It was rudimentary and largely unsuccessful, but it was a monumental first step in the history of gaming. Years after, in 1947, a patent was filed for a device that let players point and shoot a toy gun at a display. And in 1950, two scientists, Claude Shannon and Alan Turing, had independently created chess programs that computers could play, a feat previously thought impossible. These contributions laid the groundwork for what was to come, but it's hard to call them the origins of video games. Instead, they were more like early experimental tech demos of what could be, not fully fledged games. The real origins of video games can be traced back to the US military of all places. As the United States prepared for nuclear war with the Soviet Union, the gears of the military-industrial complex spun with teams of academics and researchers creating all kinds of new tech in preparation for the nuclear clock to strike midnight. And computers were at the heart of the war effort. Hutzpel was a military war game created in 1955 that simulated a war between NATO and the Eastern Bloc. You probably recognize its blue and red characters from the film War Games that used it as inspiration. Strange game. The only winning move is not to play. After the world nearly met its end in the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Department of Defense revealed Stage, another simulated war game that, instead of ending in mutually assured destruction like in war games, ended grimly with the United States overpowering the Soviet Union, at least what was left of it. Thankfully, death and destruction weren't the only thing programmers found themselves working on. They were given a lot of leeway by the military since toying around on the computer was often how they made breakthroughs, so a lot of their time was spent making games. In 1952, researchers at Cambridge created the first digital version of Tic-Tac-Toe. In 1954, Blackjack was digitized by programmers at IBM, followed by Checkers in 56. And while these projects were popular among the small niche of elite programmers, they wouldn't come close to the work of Steve Russell. In 1962, the MIT student released Space War, the first war game that was meant to be played. It was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before, so it quickly spread through the ARPANET, getting modded and changed along the way as it passed through different hands. And this represented a seismic shift in the world of video games, and it opened up the eyes of a whole lot of businessmen. After Russell's Space War, Ralph Baer began to develop video games that would hook up to your TV at home, which was a wild idea at the time. In 1968, the Magnavox Odyssey was released, making it the first commercially successful gaming console and the first step in the creation of a video game industry. The industry grew in tandem with the growing rebellious computer geek subculture that was emerging. Space War wasn't a commodity like the Odyssey. It was free, open, a piece of genius engineering that anyone with the means could crack open and tinker with. It came from the geek freak subculture that stood opposed to not only the increased commodification of games, but also to the strict military culture that video game tech came from. Instead, they were a lot closer to the new left in their opposition to the institutions of the day. They weren't in it for the money or the power, instead they were driven by a curiosity for innovation and a thirst for what was possible. This is where early hacker culture originated from, as students from MIT would gather together and try to gain access to high-level computers. In 1970, for example, rogue hackers developed a bootleg version of the copyrighted Game of Life and distributed it for free. In 1977, when creating the first multi-user dungeon, or MUD, Rob Trubshaw and Richard Bartle had to hack the computers they were using to access a restricted part of the machine's memory. And instead of copywriting their game, they distributed it independently, encouraging players to mod it as they wished. 
Meanwhile, on the business side of things, the fastest growing American company at the time was Atari. The Atari video computer system is 20 cartridges with 1300 game variations you play on your own TV set. You can't keep me in here, Atari. Let me come out when he plays a game from Atari. Have you played Atari today? The company billed itself as the synthesis of the business approach to games and the anti-work counterculture that was popular during the 60s. They promised play as work as an alternative to the soul-crushing labor of traditional office work. And their approach paid off big time, with the release of Pong catapulting Atari into a widely recognized brand. The two camps battled for the soul of what video games would be, but by the 80s, it was pretty clear who was in the lead. There was Jumpman, Donkey Kong, Space Invaders, Pac-Man, hundreds of companies pursuing video games as they had proven themselves as a massive source of profits. In 1983, total revenues peaked at $3.2 billion. Video games born out of the military-industrial complex had become a fully-fledged industry. But then, disaster struck. The video game crash of 1983 can only be described as what Marx referred to as a crisis of overproduction. As companies chased profits in the video game gold rush, they pumped out too many bad, buggy games at the expense of their overworked employees. This created a powder keg that couldn't last too long before exploding. The famous story of E.T. comes to mind. which was an awful, bug-ridden mess of a game that was coded, packaged, and shipped to store shelves in five weeks. The game was so bad that Atari, facing bankruptcy, opted to bury the unsold copies in the New Mexican desert. By 1985, revenue in the industry had fallen to a mere 100 million, a 97% drop in revenue. As the sand settled in the mass ET graveyard, the message was clear. The video game industry wasn't profitable. At least in the United States. You see, after being decimated in World War II, Japan's post-war economy focused on building up its industry and technological capacity. Like the USA, it too went through a similar military-backed expansion in video game tech, adopting a whole lot of the military tech from the victors of the war, the United States. This led to the development of a homegrown video game industry, and they didn't have a crisis of overproduction. So when Nintendo decided to release the Nintendo Entertainment System overseas, they captured the global market, and well, the rest is history. More and more big companies started trying their luck with video games, we've seen the rise and fall of titans like Sega, and as the industry enters its sixth decade, it's proven to be extremely durable. In the battle to determine the fate of video games as either commodities or open products, commodification won. And not just commodification, but just as video games grew out of the military-industrial complex, the two have remained tied at the hip, with the military routinely working with developers, influencing their games and their narratives. Recently, the army has turned to streaming video games as a recruitment tool for gamers as young as 13 years old. So clearly, the vision of early geek freaks and hackers wouldn't come to pass. But thankfully, despite attempts by the industry to completely commoditize video games, a counterculture still exists at the feet of the multi-billion dollar behemoth. Games like Counter-Strike, League of Legends, and Minecraft all began as either modded versions of existing games or as small side projects that beckoned the old days of indie development. Modding and indie communities are hotbeds of innovation, creativity, and openness that thrive in the gray area of legality and illegality. These scenes mirror the nascent age of video game development before AAA games and massive publishers, where it was just some dudes working on things they loved in their spare time. So maybe the fate of video games hasn't been completely captured by big business and military men, because the same rebellious attitude still exists in small crevices of the community. You just have to know where to look. Thanks for watching.